Start a little a couple minutes early. Sing an old hymn. Praise to the Lord, the Almighty, the King of creation. Oh, my soul, praise him, for he is the help and salvation. church. Um, hallelujah. Hallelujah is a word that gets, comes from the root word halal, Hebrew word. It means to boast, to rave, to, to shine, to celebrate, uh, to be clamorously foolish in doing so. It's where we get the word hallelujah from halal. It's used in Psalm 149. It says, let Israel rejoice in their maker. Let the people of Zion be glad in their king and let them praise, halal, his name with dancing and make music to him with tambourine and harp. Hallelujah. Let's all say it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Let's read Psalm 100 together. Start our morning, orient our hearts. 
Psalm 100. Make a joyful noise to the Lord all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into His presence with singing and know that the Lord, He is God. It is He who made us and we are His. We are His people and the sheep of His pasture. Enter His gates with thanksgiving and His courts with praise. Give thanks to Him and bless His name for the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever and His faithfulness to all generations. You all believe that? Amen. Let's do that. Let's work. Look, I, I, I do have a confession to make, you know. With the world events and things that are going on around us, I, I got to admit, I, I get frustrated lately. And, and when I read things like this Psalm 100, and he says, enter his gates with thanksgiving and in his courts of praise, that really draws me in and kind of orients my heart. And I, I need that. We all need that, right?
me. Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for the rain. Thank you that your mercies are new. Thank you that you have called us here this morning for your purpose. God, I pray that you would draw our hearts to yourself, that we would enter into your gates, into your courts with thanksgiving, through your gates with, with praise, Father. I pray that we would have a posture of humility and thanksgiving for what you have done, what you're doing, and what you're going to do. We worship you this morning, God. May we forget the troubles in the world around us. Put them aside for this moment. Lay them at your feet and trust in you. You, God, are the Lord Almighty. You are in charge.
sin was strong, but Jesus is stronger. Shame was great, but Jesus, your greater. Sin was strong, but Jesus is stronger. Shame was great, but Jesus, your greater. See, I proclaim it. Sin was strong. confess, God, that we don't always see it that way. We confess that we often look around us and see all the sin and everything against you. I know myself, I get, I get frustrated. And it's easy to lose our focus and take our eyes off the prize is you. Forgive us, God. Help us to remember that we are raised to life. In you, we are a new creation. And that you have never lost a battle. You are not surprised, ever. You are our hope.
in mind, would you turn to somebody new that you may not have known? Greet yourself, introduce yourself, make new friends. Before you're seated. Thanks. All right. Lots of good chatter going on. Uh, it's good to, uh, to be together this morning. And a special welcome to those of you who are joining us online. Anybody who is fairly new to Hope um, and you are interested in learning more or you'd like to communicate with us, 
Um, if you go to the church app, uh, those of you online, this is an easy way for you to do this. You go to the church app. There's a QR code there. You can just scan that into your camera. Put you directly to the uh, connection card. You can fill that out, and we'll be glad to get in touch with you. Several of you have been using that form of communication, and it's been great as we've been able to, uh, to connect with you, set up opportunities to, um, to meet with you, answer questions, help you to connect with ministry leaders. Uh, so continue to, to use uh, those forms of communication. Again, it's the easiest way to do it is just go to the church website, download the church app, sign up for the e-newsletter, and we will help you to get connected. All right, I'm going to invite Ginger Wade to come on up. Uh, and she has a, a fun special announcement for us as a church. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. You know what? I love to see how God works in details. Do you pay attention to details? Oh, I love it. So we get up here today, and like James is up here talking about halal. And he's talking about... Um, the meaning of some of the words of praise, of one of the words of praise in scripture. Well, <clears throat> Kirk doesn't know this, but two years, three years? When yeah. did you do a sermon series? Yeah, on? About, about three years ago. Three years two, ago, two. Kirk did a, uh, they did a sermon series on the book Holy Roar, um, which talked about the seven different Hebrew words for praise. So James, unbeknowing, um, talked about that today, and I was like, oh, that is just so cool. Well, I was gifted that book, and it took me a little while, but I did study it this past winter, and it just... Like, you know how things hit you like a ton of bricks? And I'm just like, you know what? I need to be praising God with everything and more often. And I need to be telling people about those details. So I've been making lists of details, right? There's so much that happened, little miracles in my life over the past year in, in all different ways, not just personally, but in all the things I was involved in. And I was talking, somehow I got to, talk, uh, to learning about the Feast of Tabernacles, and Steve and I talked about it. I was like, wouldn't it be really cool if we just camped, up, and my parents have 14 acres in, in Anvil, just for a week and have our own little Feast of Tabernacles. Our family, it would be cool. Like, you know, we could be there all, all week and, and do this thing. And um, they're like, yeah, it'd be cool. And lo and behold, like, right around that time, Kevin Cummer did a sermon and talked about the Feast of Tabernacles. And I was like, that's it. That, you know, it's those confirmation things that you get, right? So, of course, time goes, and we forget to plan the week. And then my parents said, well, if we want to do this thing, we got to get it on the calendar. So we're looking, so we decided to, to miniize it to four days um, over Labor Day weekend out at their place. And it is just a time to come together to fellowship. We're having a fellowship time. You can see there's going to be a, a campfire available for fellowship, two hours of fellowship time. And then we're going to get together and we're going to like, we can't raise the roof because we're outside, but we'll raise the sky, right? <laughs> With some praises to God and time for testimony. People can just get up and share. Even, it doesn't have to be a big, long, prepared story, but just a, like what you see God doing. And um, I just want to encourage you, you can come. We're having Friday, Saturday, Sunday night starting at 5 for the dinner. Um, Monday is 1 in the afternoon because, you know, got to go back to work on Tuesday. So... Um, we welcome you. There is space available for camping if you want to come and stay multiple days or if you just want to come one day or want to drive back and forth. This is about a half an hour from here. But um, we would love to see lots of you there. Bring people you know. Spread the word. There is a, a flyer out there um, on the Welcome Center. If you want to take a flyer, it looks just like this. There is a Facebook event, too, um, that I have invited a number of you to. So um, if you haven't seen that invite, check your... Check your Facebook. But um, anyway, it's just a time to put God where he belongs, which is first. And here, he's sovereign. That was one of the things I learned. God is sovereign. No matter how trashy I feel about everything that's going on, God is sovereign, and he deserves our praise, and he's going to work it out. So that's what this is all about. All right. Thank you, Ginger. I love how, um, how uh, God is at work in us, in all of us. Um, we are the church. Uh, we're not a worship service. There's not any one of us who's in charge of this except the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. And uh, as the church, we have different gifts, different abilities, and when we sign up to uh, serve God, He takes us and He uses us. So thanks for sharing this vision and sharing your family and your space, your parents' space, and thanks to your parents for opening their space for all of us to converge there and to... Uh, spend a, a weekend. This is a great time to get to know each other a little bit better and to praise, worship, have fun, sing campfire songs. Uh, do our family, we're all more the merrier kind of people. Yeah. So, so the more the merrier. The more the merrier. 
All right, kids, this is your opportunity to head to your class downstairs. For those of you who are fairly new, follow the crowd. And um, parents, somebody will help you and your child get connected. Um, and uh, we're grateful for the opportunity to teach your kids. Uh, as we transition this morning, I'd like us to just spend a few moments in prayer for events that are taking place around the world. Of course, we all are aware of what is taking place in Afghanistan, as well as the things that are transpiring in Haiti. We have ministry partners who are serving in different places around the world as well. Um, and some of them are serving in places uh, that are dangerous. So we're just going to kind of spend a few moments wrapping all of that together in a prayer. There are several prayers from the Psalms that I'm just going to read directly from the psalmist. Um, I find the Psalms to be incredibly beneficial in expressing the emotions of the heart to God. And, uh, you know, when we pray, what we're doing is simply talking. That's what prayer is. It's just simply talking. It's expressing thoughts and feelings to somebody, and that somebody is God. Um, we might do that across the table with a cup of coffee with a friend, and it's no different except that God is sovereign. So let's just speak with him this morning about things from our heart as we're concerned about the world and to invite him to do some things. God, um, all of this you are aware of. None of it caught you by surprise. You are sovereign over all. That means you stand above and beyond it. You look into the future and you not only can predict all the events, you know them all. That's why you can predict them. You always have existed. You always will exist. You are beyond our ability to comprehend. And uh, you care immensely. You care deeply. And so we... We just remind you of that. We remind you, not that you need to be reminded, but as people in a conversation with you, we remind you of who you are. We remind you that you are a good God, that you are a strong God, and that you can step in into evil that is in this world. And so as the psalmist prayed to you, we ask, Arise, O Lord, and deliver me, my God. Strike all of my enemies on the jaw and break the teeth of the wicked who are carrying guns and threatening and killing people in Afghanistan. Arise, O Lord, in your righteous anger. Rise up against the rage of the enemies. Awaken, my God, and decree justice. Give us aid against the enemy. Give, in particular, our Afghan brothers and sisters in Christ aid against the enemy who's coming to take their life. For human help is worthless. We need you. Jesus, I ask that you will encourage the church in Afghanistan to not give in to the temptation to overcome evil with evil, but instead to overcome the evil with good. May they respond out of your spirit in the face of this evil. God, I, I think of those in Haiti. Mm. Hear our cry for help. Hear their cry for help. Our King and God, for to you we pray. Arise, Lord, lift up your hand, O God, and do not forget the helpless. There are so many in Haiti right now who are helpless. They have no shelter, no protection from the storm. Use 
your church, those who love you, who are coming with aid to provide assistance. Do not be far from them because the trouble is near and there is no one to help them. Come near to them. And God, I think of our ministry partners who are in harm's way. I'm not even going to name them. I'm not going to name where they serve. We ask that today that you will protect them, that you will use them as they continue to build relationships, in particular with those who find Christians to be offensive. Use them to point others to you. Protect them. Keep them safe. And Jesus, we pray all of this in your name. Amen. You know, uh, yeah, the events of last week, I mean, you have to think of what we talked about last week in Ecclesiastes 7, and, you know, uh, it's a place to go back, and, and e- even as things were unfolding, I, again, I found myself thinking about where is God, and God being good, and God being big, and yet where is He, and all of that that we delved into last week, um, certainly many are struggling with those issues today. Today we have a different topic. Today we're going to be talking about joy and enjoyment. I mean, in direct opposition, in contrast to the hardship that many people in our world are dealing with today. But, um, you know, we just released our kids. And for those of you who hang out with kids or have the privilege of having children or being grandparents or serving around kids or, or maybe being a school teacher or whatever. You know, one of the things that's true about kids is kids, they're just crazy and silly and goofy, yeah, especially the younger ones, right? And whatever it is that they're doing, they always make it fun. You ever, you ever see that about a kid? I mean, you give them a job, you know, they're supposed to pick up the toys. Well, they, they turn it into some kind of something fun while they're picking up the toys. They're supposed to, to brush their teeth. And, what, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a simple task. Get the job done. But, but they turn it into fun. They, they just do that. You watch kids, goofy, crazy, silly. They're always making things fun. It's true of my kids. I can uh, remember a situation many, many, many years ago. A young boy was given the task. I won't name the boy. I have several of them. But a young boy was given the task, one of my young sons, of um, watering some grass. The grass had turned brown. It was late in the summer. Um, I, I had planted some new seed, and it was a job that a young boy could handle. I took him out there with the hose and showed him how to stand there and spray it and wave it back and forth and not to do a jet stream on it. And then I left him with a job that should take maybe 10 or 15 minutes because there were several spots that needed to be taken care of. Upon my return, I found um, an exuberant son. Oh, he was so excited to show me what he had accomplished in those 10 or 15 minutes while I was away dutifully working on some other project. He showed me how he had dug a channel through the ground where he could lay the hose and then he had built all around the areas uh, that needed to be watered, this little dam, so that the water could run in. And he, as he explained it to me, he said, Dad, it's so, so it, all the water can just soak in. He was so excited to show me this project that, um, yeah, that he made a new project out of the project that I had given to him. Right? And as I listened, I didn't share his exuberance. Actually, I was quite frustrated. And, you know, I began to give him some more fatherly advice about what he's doing and how he needs to, to finish the job so he can get on to the next task at hand. And as I was explaining these things, he just said, Dad, why? Like, I don't, you know, like, why? He asked that profound question that eight-year-old kids ask. Like, why? Like, what's wrong with this, right? And, you know, as I, as I, as I listened to him and, and listened to his question, I began to think, and I thought, you know what? That's a great question, because right now he doesn't have any schoolwork. We're not going anywhere as a family. There are no other chores to be accomplished. Really, there's nothing else that he needs to do except to get done with the task so he can get on with playing with his friends. And it was in that moment that it dawned on me. That's exactly what he was doing. 
he was playing. He was taking a task, a very mundane task that a grown-up will stand there and do. That's why I gave it to him. Like, who wants to stand there and hose down for 10 minutes waving the hose, right? It's a boring job. It's a monotonous job. And he made it fun. He reminded me of what the teacher says in Ecclesiastes. That's what Ecclesiastes just simply means, is teacher. What the teacher said in Ecclesiastes chapter 11, however many years a man may live, let him enjoy them all. Enjoy them all. Enjoy all of the years. And then the teacher goes on to say, be happy, young man, while you are young. Be happy while you're young. Let your heart give you joy in the days of your youth. Follow the ways of your heart and whatever your eyes see. Isn't it interesting how young people, young kids, understand this? It's just in their DNA. It's in their heart. It's the way that we have been created. Isn't that interesting? You know, the happiest person in the world, the most joy-filled person in the world, the person who has the most enjoyment and pleasure in the world is God. And we've been made in his image and in his likeness. He created the world good. He created the world beautiful. He put man in the garden to enjoy it, to appreciate it, to just live a life of joy. And it's interesting how kids, kids get that. Kids do that. But somehow, as we grow up, responsibility and something has a way of beating that out of us, doesn't it? And it turns us into people who just focus on the task. You know what I'm talking about? And, and, and why? Why is that? You know, I mean, it's, it's interesting. Why is it that we, we kind of get sucked into doing the job in order to get the job done, right? This is the why, right? We do the job to get the job done so that at the end of the job, we can sit back and relax, right? So we can sit back and enjoy things. Right? And so we, we fail to see and realize that in the moment, the moment is what we have. This is what we have right now. Right now is when we're supposed to be enjoying things, and we, we miss that. Right? And how often do, do we live life like that with that perspective? When I get the job done, then I'll enjoy it. When I get married, then I'll be happy in life. Or when we get that house, then I'll find joy in life. Or when those projects around the house are finally done, then I'll enjoy life. Or when we have children, oh, then we'll enjoy life. Oh, when the kid sleeps through the night, then we can enjoy life. But then you got to get them out of diapers. Oh, yes, when they get out of diapers, then we'll enjoy life. When they get them out of the car seat, then we'll enjoy life. When we get them through college, then we'll enjoy life. And we tend to live life thinking about when I get done with right here and right now, then I can enjoy it. And we miss how it is that we've been designed to live, and that is to enjoy life right here, right now, while we're young, following our heart. So let's dig into what Solomon has to teach us about this morning when we talk about life. We've been in this series called, right, chasing. What is it that we're chasing? Asking ourselves the question in Way back in the beginning of July, we looked at chasing pleasure, and Solomon warned. He had all kinds of warnings about chasing after pleasure. Here we see in this text that he encourages and actually commands that we pursue enjoyment. Enjoyment and pleasure are a little different, but he commands that we enjoy life. But before he gets there, he talks about the reality of life. So join me in chapter 9, looking at verse 3, and this is what the teacher Solomon, the king of Israel, writes. He says, this is the evil in everything that happens under the sun. Under the sun, that's that phrase. We keep seeing it over and over in this, in this book. Under the sun, there's evil, there's evil. What is the evil? There's one evil that he sees, that he, that he, that he, that he calls out. There's this evil in everything that happens under the sun. That one evil is that the same destiny overtakes all. The hearts of men, moreover, are full of evil and there's madness in their hearts while they live, and afterward, here's that destiny, that same destiny that takes us all. We join the dead. And then he goes on and he says, anyone who is among the living has hope. 
cool little illustration. He follows it with, even a living dog is better off than a dead lion. For the living know that they will die, but the dead know nothing. They have no further reward, and even the memory of them is forgotten. Their love, their hate, their jealousy have long since vanished. Never again will they have a part in anything that happens under the sun. So, because of these things, go eat your food with gladness and drink your wine with a joy-filled heart. For it is now that God favors what you do. Always be clothed in white, that means put on your party clothes, and always anoint your head with oil, that means put on your deodorant, your nice, fine-smelling perfume, and enjoy life with your wife or your husband, whom you have all these days of this meaningless life that God has given you under the sun, all your meaningless days, for this is your lot in life and in your toilsome labor under the sun. And whatever your hand, whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all of your might. For in the grave, we're back to where we started, for in the grave where you are going, there is neither working nor planning nor knowledge nor wisdom. So in this text, Solomon is teaching us about, he just basically, he sums up all of life very simply in this way. First, he says, death is inevitable. Secondly, he says, life is preferable. And therefore, enjoy life now while God enables you. That's the summary, right? Death is inevitable. Life is preferable. So enjoy life now that God enables you. When you pause and you think about it, that's a pretty good, simple explanation of life. Let's um, begin with the first point that he makes, that death is inevitable. Death is inevitable. He says the same destiny overtakes all. He says, we all join the dead. It doesn't matter if you're rich or you're poor, if you are the wisest person or if you're a fool, if you are a righteous person or a wicked person. It doesn't matter if you have power or you're just a commoner like the rest of us. The same fate, the same destiny is for all of us. We all end in the grave. Death is inevitable. Well, why is that? He explains why that is. He, he explains that it's the hearts of men. It's in the hearts of men. It's, it's what takes place in the hearts of men that gets men in trouble, right? It's, the, it's that the heart is wicked and evil. There's madness in the hearts of men. That word could be translated insanity. I mean, look at the streets. Look at the things that people do. Look at how they harm other people. Look at what's going on in Afghanistan. And not just in Afghanistan, but in lots of countries around the world. The insanity, the madness in the hearts of men. Not just in those men, but in people who live here in this country too. Right? It's the hearts of men that are insane. Or as Jeremiah the prophet says, the heart is deceitful above all things. Desperately wicked who can understand it. Or as Paul says in Romans, he says, as it is written, there's no one righteous, not even one. There's no one who understands, no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They have together become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. And then as Paul kind of sums it up, for the wages of sin, because of the madness in the hearts of men, because man's hearts are evil and wicked, the wages, the earnings, the results of the sin in our heart is death. Death is inevitable. And it's inevitable because sin came into the world. Genesis 3, God tells us, well, to the man, he says, uh, to the ground, from the ground you came to the ground, 
you will return. But it's interesting in this text, Solomon doesn't dwell there. And other times, in other places, in Ecclesiastes, he seems to spend more time causing us to think about the inevitable, that death is inevitable. But he, he seems, in this passage, to want to highlight something else. He starts there, death is inevitable, but he, he, but he makes a turn. And it's almost as if to say, let's not stay gloomy. I've been gloomy enough, right, in talking about life. Let's not, st- let's not stay there, because life is preferable. I mean, being alive is way better than being dead, right? And he uses that illustration of the dead, a living dog is better off than a dead lion. And in his day, uh, uh, dogs would run in packs. Dogs were not pets. People didn't keep them in their home and give them a nice little bed and have their nice treats and buy them Christmas presents and have strollers that they take them in a, a, a walk for, right? You know, I mean, that's not, Solomon's day is not like that. And in other countries in the world, even today, it's not like that, where dogs, they just roam the streets. Uh, They carry diseases. They're annoying. People chase them away. So his illustration here is to say, here this most miserable, most disliked animal is better off than the king of the jungle, the most majestic animal, the lion who rules. Right? Even the Even the live dog is better than the dead lion. Life is is so much better than death, right? His point is this. It's living, the living have consciousness and hope. We have things that we can enjoy, but the dead, those who have deceased, have no consciousness. They have no hope. They have no enjoyment, for their passions are gone, right? Their love, their hate, their jealousy, it's all gone. Never again, once we end up in the grave, never again will we have those. But the living, the living, ah, the living, the living, they have opportunities that the dead do not, right? Those who are alive have hope. They have something to do. And his, his admonition is like, don't get all swallowed up in the reality that death is inevitable. Don't get strong. Don't, 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 don't spend so much time being gloom and doom there. Don't, don't live with such a negative outlook on life. You're alive. You have hope. So be optimistic and enjoy it now. Because it's almost as if he's saying, you know, if you're reading this text, You're processing the thoughts of what it is that I'm recording. You're hearing what it is that I'm saying. You're at a better place than me because I'm in the grave. You're alive. You can enjoy things. So go for it and enjoy them. Which is, now he makes a really, really hard, hard turn. Hey, he started at death is inevitable. Life is preferable. Now he goes to enjoy life now while God enables you. So he says in verse 7, right, go eat your food with gladness. And there's four words that he uses here in this text. Gladness is one of them. Joy is the other one, this joyful heart. And then he says, enjoy life with your wife in verse 9, and then do it with all of your might in verse 10. That word gladness, starting back in verse 7, eating your food with gladness is, is with delight. It's a, it's a feeling or an attitude of joyful happiness or cheerfulness. It's, it's an attitude, which seems to indicate there's like a choice to it, right? So have a good attitude about what's served to you. Have a, have a great appreciation for the food that you have. In, with joy, receive it. And then this idea that um, of joyful, have a joyful heart with the wine that you're consuming. Um, that word is used in opposition. It's, it's, it's like a word, uh, like a word speaking about morality, used in opposition of evil. Almost as if to say, don't use your wine in an evil way, so much as to use wine to cover up things that are broken inside of you. Don't go there. Don't use it in that. But, but enjoy what it is that you have for it's a pleasant and a pleasing experience to eat and drink. You think about it, it's one of the basic things of life, right? We eat and we drink. 
So in the most basic things, enjoy them. Enjoy your food. And then this word, enjoy, when he says, enjoy life with your wife, that actually is, um, root, its root word is connected to seeing, to looking, to viewing, which is pretty interesting when he, he, that he uses this word to talk about relationship. See the person. Look at the person. View the person. It's almost as if it's not just physical seeing, but it's, it's where intimacy is, right? Intimacy resides in my heart connecting with your heart. It's me seeing and feeling what it is that you are thinking and feeling, me understanding what it is that you're expressing. Psalm says, enjoy life with your spouse. And then lastly, he uses a do it with all of your might. It's, it's as if to say vigorously with all of your energy, dig a channel through the dirt, build a dam around it so that the water can flow. Live life like that in whatever it is that you do. And so there's these three concepts that it seems like he's talking about when he says enjoy, when he's talking about life. So so he says enjoy, enjoy life, and the life piece, it seems like what he's talking about is food, right? Enjoy your food, what you eat and your drink. Enjoy your relationships, in particular with your spouse, and then enjoy what it is that you do, your work and your play. No, he says, whatever it is that your hands finds to do. You know, um, we do a lot of eating every day, right? And there can be pleasure in it, or we can just kind of go through life quickly and not even taste what it is that we're consuming because we're on to the next thing. This past spring, I was up fishing north central Pennsylvania with some of my family members, and uh, you bring along food. And I'd never been to this place where we were staying, and they had been there a couple of days ahead of me. It's my cousins and my brother. And I bring along my stash of food, and out on the table, I throw a package of Aldi chocolate sandwich cookies filled with white filling. Typically, I'm not a guy who would buy uh, chocolate sandwich cookies. Oreos is the only chocolate-filled sandwich cookie that I would buy. Any other ones in the giant brand, I just, they just don't do it for me. But, but, but just, a, but, but just a, a, a little while before that, I had had one of these Aldi cookies. And so I decided I'd buy a pack of them and bring them along. And I threw them out there on the table and... Um, my brother grabbed a handful of them, and he was eating them, and he said, where, do, what, what, where, where are these from? These are from Aldi? Oh, but they're pretty good. Handed a couple over to my cousin Chris and said, here, why don't you have a couple of these? And they're, yeah, they're not too bad, Chris says. And then Kevin says, you got these at Aldi? How much, how much, how much is that? A buck 55. Buck 55. Oreos are 3 dollars He's like, wow, a buck. I definitely am going for the Aldi cookies. I mean, these, these compare just about with, with the Oreos. What about you, Chris? What do you think? And Chris's like, no. Chris eats Oreos every day. It's like, no, I'm not doing that. Like, but it's, but it's $1.55 versus $3.99. Chris says, it doesn't matter. I'm enjoying my Oreo cookies. And you know, in that moment, I thought, that, there's a lot of wisdom there. I mean, he's right. He's, he, he's, he says, you know, I only have a short amount of time to live, and while I'm living, I'm just going to enjoy it. I'm going to enjoy the way it tastes. And so for $3.99 instead of $1.55, he invests his money that way and enjoys his food. Enjoy your food. Again, how often do we just slam it down, miss its taste? and not appreciate what it is that we've been served. My family loves to hear me say after a good meal, oh, that is so delicious. That is so delicious. I use that word delicious when I really enjoy what it is. One of my uh, adult kids had us over for dinner this past week, 
and served a delicious meal. It was so, so good. Grilled shrimp, Alfredo sauce, linguine noodles, shrimp Alfredo, chicken Alfredo, this amazing, delicious garden salad. I enjoyed that meal with my son and his wife and with my wife. It was so good. And that's what Solomon is saying. Just enjoy it. You know, because that, that's what you have. You have right now. Right now is what you have. Don't live for tomorrow. Don't live for the next. It Live now. Enjoy your food. And then he says, not only enjoy your food, but enjoy your relationships, right? Enjoy your, enjoy your, your spouse and, and enjoy life with your wife. And as I thought about this passage, I thought about how well, this gets complicated, right? I mean, relationships are really challenging. And I don't, I don't want to simplify how complex relationships are. And some of us here are in very hard relationships. And it hurts. And so when we read this, there's not a lot of enjoyment in our marriage. There's not a lot of things that we do value. And so that's a whole other message. And this message, though, which is the message that we're in, we're just going to kind of just acknowledge that, but go to what Solomon says, and that is that enjoy life with your wife. Enjoy your relationship. There's no point in staying angry. (laughs) There's no point in holding grudges. There's no point in continuing to bicker and fight. Today is what you have. Today is what you have. Today is what you have with your spouse. Get past the frustrations. Let it go. Yes, they're real. But let them go. Get quicker back to enjoying the relationship with each other. Because now is what you have. And then, and then he says, whatever it is that you find your hand to do, do it with all your might. And it's interesting, he says, whatever your hands, whatever your hands find to do. There's lots of things our hands can find to do, including our jobs, but way more than just our jobs, right? Holding a fishing pole. Wow, there's a lot of joy in holding a fishing pole. For others, it's very frustrating. So you might not hold a fishing pole. But for those of us who enjoy holding a fishing pole, how often do we hold a fishing pole? And flipping those burgers. You know, it's raining right now, and you might be having a plan for a barbecue. And that could be a real pain in the neck, unless you're a kid. Kids somehow love to be in the rain. And dancing in the rain, they would make it a fun experience to flip the burgers in the rain. That one right there definitely thinks so, right? What is it that your hand finds to do in whatever situation it might be in, right? Sanding the cabinets, taking the engine apart, holding onto the handlebars while you ride, braiding the hair, putting on the makeup, making the lasagna, sipping a cup of coffee, hanging out with a friend, whatever it is that your hand finds to do. Solomon says, enjoy it. Enjoy it. Enjoy life right here, right now, because right here and right now is what you have. Do you see that? Enjoy life now. Right? Verse 7, he says, go eat your food with gladness. Drink your wine with a joyful heart, for it is now. It is now that God favors what you do. Right now. Now is the time. That's what he said in Ecclesiastes chapter 11. However many years a man may live, let him enjoy them all. Be happy, young man, while you're young. The implication is now. Enjoy it now while God enables you to enjoy it now with the implication that there's going to be harder times. There'll be more difficult times. There's going to be challenges in life. There will be times when I can enjoy things because life will hurt because of its challenges, which is what we talked about last week. But right now, while God enables you, enjoy it. Live it up. You know, as you kind of um, look at all of this and maybe summarize it in a couple of application points, there are two things that, that um, kind of have come to my mind as I reflected on this passage this past week. One of them is this, simply this. Invest in the things that you enjoy most. 
I learned this principle a long time ago. It was probably in 2004 or 5. I was listening to a cassette tape. Yeah, I was listening to a cassette tape. Not even a, not even a, a DVD or CD. It was a cassette tape. For those of you who are younger, it would be a podcast. Okay? I was listening to a podcast about finances from a Christian perspective. And one of the things that Larry Burkett, who's no longer living, said is, you know, God has given you your money. He's given you your resources. We looked at this a couple of weeks ago. Don't just hoard it. Don't just keep it. Don't just keep it all for yourself. Don't just hoard it. But invest it in things that you enjoy. And, you know, as I digested that, it affected some decisions that I then made and purchases that I made regarding things that I enjoy doing the most. And rather than just buying the Aldi brand, I chose to buy the expensive name brand because it was something that I was going to be doing for a long time, hunting and fishing. And so I invested over 15 years ago, and I'm still utilizing that equipment that I purchased 15 years ago rather than the cheaper stuff. It's still holding up, and it's given me so much joy and pleasure as I've used it in the things that I enjoy doing. Invest in the things that you enjoy most. Secondly, let go of the fear and the frustration and enjoy what you have right now. You know, sometimes things are stinky, right? Sometimes things get dirty. I can remember right after our firstborn was born, he was just a couple months old. We were coming out of a grocery store. This is in Rochester, New York. We were, I was doing a one-year internship at Grace Evangelical Free Church, Rochester, New York. Came out of the grocery store, and there was Doug and his wife. And they, they were like, oh, look at your little baby. You know, we got him in a little shopping cart, the whole deal. Like, look at your little baby. And da, 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 da. You know, we're all catching up because it's the first time we'd seen him. We knew them from church. And Doug looked at me in the parking lot, and he said, Kirk, enjoy changing his diapers. Like, what, what, a, what, kind of, what kind of advice is that, right? Enjoy changing his diapers because it's going to go really fast. You know, here I am 27 years later with that illustration still in my mind. I've shared that with many young parents. Enjoy changing the stinky diapers. You know, the reality is, in life, there are stinky things, right? There are difficult things. There are things that are no fun. There are things that, that are just dirty and stinky. But in them, we can find enjoyment. It's an attitude. It's an attitude. It's a choice. But we can find it. I close with this. And this is maybe even an application. I don't know if you've ever seen the movie The Bucket List. 2007, 2008, something like that. If you haven't, there you go. There's something you can go and do and watch. There's some inappropriate language and things, but for the most part, the bucket list tells the story of two characters, uh, Jack Nicholson and Morgan Freeman. They play these characters, and they both find themselves, Jack Nicholson, he owns this, uh, all these hospitals, and he wakes up, and he's in a hospital bed next to Morgan Freeman, and they both have been diagnosed with cancer. And... Um, so the movie is about these two guys who are going to die within a few months. And Nicholson finds on the floor a piece of yellow paper with lines on it, and it's all crumpled up laying there on the floor, and he begins to read it. Morgan Freeman had thrown the paper on the floor. He'd been back to Nicholson, and he hears him ruffling through his paper. He says, hey, what are you doing? What are you doing? He says, I found this on the floor, and I'm just kind of reading through it. Like, That's not for you. He said, what is it about? And so this is what Morgan Freeman goes on. He says, he says, my freshman philosophy professor assigned us an exercise in forward thinking. He called it a bucket list. He said, suppose uh, we were supposed to make a list of, of all the things we'd like to do in life before we kick the bucket. And so I wrote down a few things. He said, like, make a million dollars, become the president. You know, young man's wishes. He said, I was going to redo the list, but it's pointless now. It's pointless now. We have three months to live. Jack Nicholson interrupts him. He says, I would argue the exact opposite. And then Nicholson, he begins to write down things like um, skydiving, climbing the pyramids, driving race cars, kissing the most beautiful woman in the world, all these crazy things. And then the rest of the movie, that's what it's about. Now, what's interesting is Jack Nicholson is a human being, right? He plays the character in this play. 
But shortly before the movie was released, he was interviewed by Parade Magazine in this article, I want to go on forever. And Nicholson said these words. He said, I used to live so freely. The mantra for my generation was, be your own man. I, was, I always said, hey, you can, you can have whatever rules you want. I'm going to have mine. I'll accept the guilt. I'll pay the check. I'll do the time. In other words, I'm just going to live life freely. I'm going to go do what I want. I'll choose my own way. That was my philosophical position well into my 50s. But as I've gotten older, I've had to adjust. We all want to go on forever, don't we? We fear the unknown. Death is inevitable. Everybody goes to the wall, yet nobody knows what's on the other side. That's why we fear death. You know, what is missing from all of Nicholson's understanding about life is God. You see, it was the teacher who said, you know, while you're young, live it up. Enjoy life, but know this. When your life comes to an end, you will stand before God in judgment. So while you're living your life now and you're enjoying it, live it knowing that, life, that, your de- that death is inevitable, and when death comes, you will stand before God, who is your judge. It's really clear. Nicholson doesn't know this. He fears death, appropriately so, because he doesn't know what's on the other side. Nobody told him. God's on the other side. Nobody told him that he's separated from God and the only way to connect with God is through a relationship with Jesus Christ. The only way to connect with God, who is holy and perfect, is to have no sin. The only way we can have no sin when all of us are sinful is to have somebody pay our sin and to stand in our place before God. The only person who can do that and who has done that is Jesus Christ, God in flesh, who came to take your sin and my sin, to die on a cross. And when he died on the cross, he paid the penalty of your sin. And all you have to do is just say, Jesus, I need you to forgive me of my sin. One day I'll stand before you and I want to be received into your kingdom. Where do you stand? All of us, One day, we'll stand before God. Before we get there, let's enjoy life. And while we're living this life, God tells us how to live life, not as a hedon, not in hedonistic ways, not in self-fulfilling, selfish ways. Scripture is full of how to live it in a joy-filled way. But one day, one day, we'll all stand before the judge. Would you pray with me? Jesus, we thank you for this book and this teacher. The topics, the topics that he covers, the insights that he gives to us about life. I pray for those this morning who are in the dirty places. It just stinks. Right now, there isn't much joy. I pray, God, that you will be their comfort in these hard times, that you will encourage them. And I pray for those who find themselves in life where they're just kind of bebopping along, not really aware that right here and right now is what they have. Ah, awaken us all to smell the roses while we're living, to dig the channels, to let the water run, to allow the dams to be built, to just enjoy the task at hand. Help us today as we leave this place and go out in the rain and go home and and cook food and eat it together to just enjoy that time. And it's in your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Would you stand with us?
church. Go and enjoy your day. And next week when you come back, you're coming back to a unique opportunity. Some of you may find it a little bit challenging. I'm just warning you. Next week's going to be different. And I'm going to do two things. Right now I'm going to invite those of you who don't have kids, if you would choose to come to the next service, 1045, the second service, next Sunday, rather than this service, that would be helpful. The service is kind of full. And just for the things that are going to happen next week, which you don't want to miss, it's going to be a special morning. I'm not going to give you too many more details. Um, but come looking forward to a unique opportunity uh, that will taste pretty good and should be enjoyable. See you next week.